Hey, what's going on, guys? Happy Fight Week. First of all, I wanted to just say thank you for being here. Thank you to Chael for doing this podcast. I appreciate you, man. Um, guys, if you like this podcast, if you like this video, hit. make sure you leave a like. Make sure you subscribe to this video, or to this channel, rather. Sorry. Uh, make sure you share this video with your friends. Guys, it's Fight Week. We need to flood this place with some with some fight content. Um, you know, Chael and I get into it. We talk wrestling. We talk fighting. Um, we talk a couple other things. Life. So, you know, guys, stick through to the end. Make sure you leave a comment. Make sure you like. Make sure you subscribe. Guys, If you also, if you want somebody or you want to be, you know somebody, or if you want to be that somebody on my next interview, my next podcast, hit me a DM at Barbell Robertson. I should... Uh, my Instagram should be right here. Um, hit me a DM. I'll definitely respond to you, um, and we'll see what we can do. We'll try to get you on the show. So, guys, without further ado, let's get to the interview. Chill. What up, brother? What's going on, buddy? How was your drive? It was good. I uh, I had to drop my pastor off at the airport, so it was oh, good. Very good. You had to drive all the way there, then all the way back. Well, he drove there. I drove back. Oh, gotcha. Cut out a little bit. How's your day going, man? Good. Thank you. I had a I had a, I got up at one thirty this morning. I'm not one thirty guy, but I got up at one thirty, and then shucks, I never went back to sleep. So I've uh, I've had a long day, even though it's already one o'clock. I already I already put twelve hours in. Gotcha. I like the uh, I like the shirt. It looks good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Kevin I, just gave me that. I think Rudis made it. Rudis is a good company. They got Ben Askren, so they can't that's go wrong, you know? That's right. They're doing a good job. So how's what uh what's what's new by the way? Where's the season at? Man, um I would love to sit here and tell you, hey, it's going great. I'm ranked number one in the nation and uh undefeated, but it uh hasn't exactly gone my way, but um Still, still kicking it. Still, uh, still got the same goals, and, and we're gonna work hard to get them this second term. Yeah, I was gonna say you're only, you're only part way through, but good. So that's awesome. How's the team looking? Anything exciting? Any new recruits or anything I should know about? Man, we we look good, but we look young. But I think we've got a lot of um, a lot of good young guys stepping up, and uh, and and just ready to go. We just beat uh, Michigan in the duel. So number twenty two ranked Michigan. Wow. And and um we beat uh Northern Colorado the other night. So right. so so things are looking good, man. We've got a we've got a good solid team. There's not a lot of um there's really no pessimism. Um everybody's positive, everybody wants the same thing. I think it's just a matter of uh you know, climbing that um you know, climbing that wall and getting Michigan's it. Michigan's a good win. That's yeah, a good win. Really good win. Um, they've got a lot of studs. So where was that? Was that on the road? Was that in Ann yeah, Arbor? Yeah, that was in Ann Arbor. Oh, very cool. So, I didn't know that. So yeah, we. Uh, I, I think I think we got a lot of good things coming. Everybody, um, it just as far as the team goes, everybody seems to be doing the right things. You know, eating the right way, living the right way. You know, going to church, going to Bible studies. Just you know, straight and narrow. What you would look at a team and say, okay, what. What do these guys do outside of the room? And and I think we got a team that does the right things. And what about Ronnie? Is Ronnie Bressler, does he still come in the room? Or did he move away? He lives in Florida now. I don't really okay. know exactly what he's doing. I don't know if anybody knows what he's doing right now. I think he's, uh, last I heard, he was coaching a club in Florida. But, oh, um, okay. So he's still involved. He's doing something. Yeah, he's involved in the sport. So, But, yeah, he didn't uh, he didn't compete for the Open, which I thought was surprising. So I think he's one of those guys that, you know, maybe left a little bit on the table and wanted some more, but apparently he didn't. Sure. Goes so, that way sometimes, right? You've had yeah. enough, you've had enough. Yeah. I, shoot, man, I, I feel it. I can, uh, I'm just with, you know, this being my last year, I can, I can feel it creeping in. You know, I don't want it to be over, but when it's over, I'll be, I'll be glad. It, you know what I mean? I'm sure yeah. you under, it's like, I'm. You know, you're you're pushing through it for the principle, but uh, other than that, it's like. And there's man. nothing longer feeling than a wrestling season. Oh my I mean, gosh. it just feels like it's it just never ends. Like you know, the weeks and it, it just stands. I mean, it's just part of one of the things. You know, I mean, along those lines, but the very few guys that are able to go undefeated and be champions and things like this, like man, you really deserve a lot of credit to be undefeated to be able to do that. 
And a lot of those guys don't go on, like we were talking about with Bressler, a lot of those guys had fired their last bullet at some point, but they used it all up. They did great. They focused. They stayed in it, but they are done. And it's not just physically, Christian, it's mentally. They are done. And I, I get that. I never was the undefeated guy, like that, but I saw them. And it is an impressive thing on the road, the weigh-ins. Not to mention one thing about wrestling that nobody ever talks about. It's always during six sick season. Like everybody gets sick in the winter time, right? The weather's cold. You're not sleeping enough. You're malnourished for a lot of weight classes, and then you're overtraining. I mean, that's the perfect petri dish to get sick. And those guys that push through and find a way to go, you know, 34, 35, and O, oh, it's it's remarkable. I have to ask you: Are we in the absolute worst area for that? For sickness, I mean, yes. You got you got to think, guys. In I mean, maybe not the Midwest, but and there's not a lot of. Uh, I mean, it'd be better in the Midwest, but when it's raining out here in Oregon, I mean, you got to think, guys in California should have a leg up on on some of the guys up here in Oregon or in you know states that actually have seasons. I right, feel like just because just because of the weather. Is that what you're talking about? I agree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I had uh, I didn't have the flu, but but I had a cold and. And it feels like there's no sport worse than wrestling to expose how sick you really are. I agree I, with that. You know, and I'll tell you just on our state level, but our state tournament is right around the time of the college conference tournament, right at the end of February. And you'll see more upsets in the Oregon state tournament than any state tournament anywhere. But the reason is half the roster shows up with, you know, with the flu. Half the roster is laying down in the back. They can barely get to the mat. It's just one of these things, to your point, where we live and time of year and then everything else that goes into it, the weight cutting and the, the overtraining, it's just one of these things. And, uh, I, I, yeah, there's no way to get around it. I mean, the season of wrestling isn't going to change, and neither is the weather, but it is a reality. Yeah, I feel like um, it's funny because the season is really long, and people outside of the sport don't really have a, have a grasp of how long it is. And I, I, people are always like, "Hey, what are you doing? You know, this month." It's like, uh, I'm, I've got wrestling. Like, really? When, when did wrestling start? You're like six months ago. It, it ends in another six. Like, it's all here. Like, it doesn't. Exactly. And they're just like, "You guys have a long season." It's like, yeah, it's. I mean, it's six months of where you actually compete, and then it's another six months of training, and you sure. get like a weekend or two off here and there. I mean, that's. It. I mean it. Yeah, and, and back to my point earlier, I, I I was sick a little bit this year, and and I didn't think I was that sick until I went in the wrestling room and I was like, oh my gosh, I am I'm sick. Like it, I don't. I mean, you just and it was one of those practices where people came in and watched, and it was like, <laughs> you know, you just want to tell everyone I am sick, but it's like that just sounds like excuses, you know. Of course, of course. And so wrestlers show up while they're sick, and then that becomes, again, a Petri dish, right? There's no open windows, and we just pass it to one another. It's just, oh. it's one of those deals, but it's one of those things that I'm not sure other people can relate to. I, you know, I'm just not sure they see it the way in the human contact that you have, and then you pass it to the next guy who passes it to the next guy. I mean, and it goes around for months. It's a mess. Oh, it's awful. So do you still, do you still keep up with the sport? I mean, you're, you keep up with everything, but um, you keep up with the sport a lot. Like, do you know what's going on in the NCAA right now? Are you aware of all this stuff? Yes, definitely. Okay. Big fan. Gotcha. So I, I heard you. Um, I heard you. I saw one of your videos the other day, and you were talking about uh, you were talking about the different martial arts and you know how wrestlers have been so successful. But you you don't. Do you think wrestling is the best base to have for martial arts? Yeah, I do, and I think that you have to have it, but. If I was to elaborate on that fact, it used to be for sure wrestling was number one. And even if you go through today's current champions, for the most part, to your point, yes, wrestling is the base, of, even the predominant base. But it used to be a time when that was all you could need. And now wrestling, by at least by techniques, you know, they don't largely work like they used to. You can't just come across the ring, find your range, change elevation, and go tackle the other guy. That doesn't work. Guys' defenses are just really good. But still the wrestler's mindset, all the way down, you know, from the training to the grind to making the weight to being in different – just understanding how to go out there and compete with somebody else while people are watching. That's a really big deal. And we put so much focus on, you know, a jab and a cross and these type things. But if you can go out there and compete – half naked while the world is watching and that's something you learn to do through wrestling you know that i think that's what the wrestlers really bring to the table now far more 
than they do a, a you know a body lock or an inside trip. I feel it's just that ability to grind and compete in front of people. So okay, so that that makes a lot of sense. Just like wrestlers coming to the sport is a lot more effective than just wrestling. Yeah. What, I really like how you said that. Can I steal that? I like how you said that. Wrestlers are doing really great in mixed martial art. Wrestling is a part of mixed martial arts. But, you know, the higher level wrestler you were, and again, I'm going back, I'm time framing this thing, but that was whoever was going to win. Whoever was the high, higher level was the guy that's going to win. And you don't really see that now. Guys that have a good understanding of it. TJ Dillashaw comes to mind just for a name that you would know. Now, TJ wrestled at a very high level, and I don't mean to discredit him, but if you were to compare his wrestling career, where he was one of the guys to the greatest fighter in the world under mixed martial arts, you know, I think it shows you like just that good understanding, or if you were to juxtapose that, and I hope this doesn't sound like an insult, but again, I'm just trying to form an example. If you were to take Henry Cejudo, who on paper has achieved everything in the sport of wrestling you could possibly achieve, but it doesn't really carry over to the cage too much. I mean, he really relies a lot on his striking, on his footwork, on his toughness, on his chin. He relies on some other tools that have taken him to the top aside from what won him the Olympic medal. So it does appear to me like at some point that wrestling tops out. I think Yoel Romero might be another great example. It sounds like I might have just insulted Cejudo and Yoel. Not at all what I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to prove that they had to learn other skills. And they did, and it took them to the top. But back to your uh, premise that it's the wrestler, not the wrestling. Do you think... So I've thought about this, because I, I do think, you know, wrestling is a very valuable skill. But I feel like, you know, if a world champion in wrestling goes at it with... And, and he only knows wrestling, and he goes at it with a guy that's a world champion in jiu-jitsu, he's going to get tapped out, right? I mean, we just saw that with... With uh, with Gordon with Gordon Ryan and Bo Nickel, and, and obviously you know I think Bo did a lot better than maybe a lot of people gave him credit for, but there was more of a style that went in that there was a strategy, and and he kind of played the game a little bit. They put rules in place, but Bo with no bo- and you know Bo does some MMA training and stuff, and he's making that transition. But both of those just bringing their skills to the table. I think Gordon wins that. Wouldn't wouldn't you say? I think so too, you know. But don't and, but don't forget, and we just do have to add this if we're just two guys philosophizing and and, and debating what we saw there. Uh, they were just grappling, and if we, so, that is a little bit different. You know, the, the more dominant of the grappling arts does appear to be jujitsu, just because you can stretch a guy out, just because position isn't as favored under say Abu Dhabi rules, or with those two went and competed and they were in third coast grappling that had kind of its own rule set. It wasn't exactly Abu Dhabi, but we can agree that it was at least a grappling submission style match which Bo didn't do I don't know if you made that an MMA fight I mean Bo did have position position is so favored in MMA whereas position and grappling isn't favored those guys are more than happy to sit the, you know sit themselves down or put themselves right on their back which as wrestlers is something that we look at and go whoa why would you ever want to be in that spot so it's, it's kind of one of those things I don't know I think both of those guys would transition very well but I think if you were to just throw him out there with the way they had it, it looked like, you know, Bo would have been in a pretty good spot to land some pretty good strikes. Yeah. No, I agree. And um, and, and like I was saying, I, I th- but I think, like what I said earlier, you know, wrestlers, I just, I, I've never seen, and, and you can attest to this, but other martial arts, they don't grind like wrestlers do. It doesn't, it's just no disrespect to them, but I don't know if it's the sport. I don't know if it's, that they can't, that they've hit their max, or if wrestling has just been around so long that the bar is so high that you have to do that. I don't know. What what would be your stance on that, your take? Because wrestlers come over to the sport and they dominate. I mean, we've w- there's eight champions. Six of them are former wrestlers. Sure. I mean, those statistics. And, and, you know, the six before that were former wrestlers. Like, wrestlers just hand their belts over to wrestlers. So it just seems like, you know, it... It may not be the base coming off the bat that is going to propel you, you know, to the top as quick. Like you're not going to come into the room, you're going to get humbled a little bit more than maybe, uh, you know, uh, obviously inspiring than maybe a Muay Thai guy. But I feel like you have a much stronger base to build on. Would you? Would you say that's? I would definitely agree with that. I mean, and, and here, here might be how I would say to somebody: if if you came in with a wrestling background and you spent six months in jujitsu, you're going to be okay on the ground. You're going to be able to defend yourself and pull up, particularly with the strikes involved. You're going to be okay there. If you came in with any other background and then spent six months wrestling, it, you're not going to learn it. It's it's not going to be enough. You're going to get put in positions. You're going to be held there. You know, particularly you and I throwing the word grind out, but particularly one of the reasons American wrestlers have done better than anywhere else 
is because of the collegiate rules. You know, when yep. you're forced to try to get up off the bottom against your will or to hold a man down against his will, that's really the aspect, in my opinion, that changes things. I mean, there's a reason we haven't seen, you know, these world and Olympic medalists from other countries come in and do well. Yes, yeah, some of them can get a takedown, but if you're not used to holding a guy there or vice versa, you slipping it up on by, you're not used to, you know, hand fighting and scrambling and a Grammy to a switch, you know, putting a chain together to scramble back up to your feet. It's a totally different game. And it really does seem like the American wrestlers, because of the collegiate system, I feel like that's their leg up. Yeah. I really do. I feel like that's the one thing that really separates them. And that's why we haven't seen some of these medalists from other parts of the world come here and, and dominate. I, I get in this conversation a lot, and I'm I'm sure you've been in it too, but a lot of people want to I don't even know if it's a lot, but there's a, a minority that is very loud that wants to change collegiate wrestling to freestyle or Greco. And, and and my thought is, hey, we're getting all these guys that come into MMA. That's their, I mean, that's their only outlet. Like, you know, guys in Russia, they can make money doing freestyle at a younger age. That's all they do. But guys here, they have to make that transition. Would you say that that's, I mean, I feel like that would be stupid if we change it. I feel like that's the leg up we have. I feel like that's why our guys are in so much better shape is because there's an aspect of wrestling that we're not missing like we are in freestyle. And I feel like that's what gives our guys the advantage when it comes to fighting is we know how to hold guys down. We know how to keep them there. And we know how to deal with that when somebody gets us on the ground. And that shape and conditioning is so much different too, right? I love the point you're making on MMA, but I'll, t I'll take your theme and I'll just steer it over to international wrestling. I mean, I feel like this experiment just got proven to not be true that you need to focus on collegiate and Greco-Roman. I feel as though Schneider came in and proved to us, if you focus on collegiate, you will be in better shape. You will be able to go six minutes harder than anybody in the world, that particularly with a rest in between, particularly with you know the way parterre works. And then I feel as though Adam Kuhn came in who's living in Michigan, not trained any Greco. He came in and, and then solidified it, you know, for Greco-Roman as well. I feel that Spencer Lee, I feel that what Dayton Fix just did, or, or, or even Yanni, uh, you know, a year ago, I feel as though they're proving that staying in those collegiate rooms, and yeah, you got to go work, you know, 10 or 15 minutes of, of, of parterre afterwards, but that, that's been a recipe that's been around forever. The guys that used to make World Olympic teams before we had funding at the Olympic Training Center, before we had these regional training uh, sites around the nation, they used to just stay in the college room after the college workout. They'd pick a couple of guys and they'd go parterre for about 15 minutes. They'd show up to the, I mean, John Smith and the Brands Brothers won World Olympic Championships doing that. I don't have to go all the way back to 93. Again, I can go uh, much more recent to Adam Kuhn and Kyle Schneider's success. But it seems that even what Spencer Lee's doing right now, mm -hmm. Spencer Lee's resting a full collegiate schedule, goes to the National Open, runs through absolutely everybody. I mean, I feel as though this keeps getting proven that collegiate is the greatest way to train for international wrestling, regardless of how that sounds in the logic, I feel as though the results are proving that the tougher and harder of the two sports lessen it up a little bit. The condition is totally different. You've got to leg up. Yeah, and I think, too, just from uh, mental, like we were talking about earlier, I think where the mental toughness comes in is from top and bottom. I think it is from... There's nothing more demeaning than being held down, and and there's nothing harder than holding somebody down, and I I think I think that's where a lot of guys I just feel like I I so I went overseas this summer and I wrestled uh, with some of the Azerbaijani and Georgian guys, and you get a couple take and and it it's even on your feet for a minute, but you get a couple takedowns on these guys and they break they wilt they want to see what you weigh on the scale like there's every excuse in the book for them to no, like for them to not understand. Like, or for them to uh, give why they didn't win that match or why they got um, you know taken down, and I just feel like you don't see that with the Americans because of that. You know, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna take you down. I'm gonna hold you here, and and, and you're gonna like it. It, it. Would you say? I mean, I feel like that is the biggest contributor to a wrestler's mental toughness. Hundred percent. I, I could not agree with you more. Dave Schultz used to. Uh... He was a great collegiate wrestler, NCAA champion, but he didn't like collegiate wrestling. He liked freestyle, and he used to, when people would do collegiate, he used to call it stallegiant. Oh, you're doing stallegiant. He thought it was just a, a, a born and a slow-paced style, and I was always so confused by that. It's like, 
that stuns me because that's not how I see collegiate. I mean, even the stall rules and the way that they'll hit you, I feel as though you could take a lot more breathers and a lot more breaks in international wrestling. Now, international wrestling is extremely hard. I'm just trying to prove the point that of the styles, collegiate is the bigger grind. Collegiate all the way down, not only to the positions of trying to get off the bottom, trying to hold somebody down, being rewarded to do each, but also, uh, you know, where the calls are made. The fact that there is no breaks in between. Uh, the fact that it is seven minutes as opposed to six with a rest in between. I just find it the harder of the styles. And I feel like the guys who are training it right now, Yawning's a great example. Spencer's a great example. Coon's a great example. Snyder's a great example. The guys that stay in the collegiate rooms and keep that level of conditioning, man, you can't get around it. You can talk about singles and doubles all you want. You and I both know as competitors, rule number one, conditioning. Yeah, absolutely. So also, too, I want to I wanna ask you this because – you know, obviously freestyle and Greco is contested in just about every country in the world. Why is folk style the most popular style? If it's only contested yeah. in one, why, why is there going to be 50,000 people at the NCAAs this year in Minnesota, but there's only going to be, there's only 5,000 people maybe that go to the Olympic trials. Yeah. How come nobody talks about that? See, I agree with you too. And even when people are saying, you know, we should do away with collegiate, we should just do freestyle and Greco. Roman said, well, I don't know if fanfare supports that. I've been to those freestyle and Greco tournaments, and they're absolutely incredible, and they're also very poorly attended. So I'm with you on that. You know, the NCAA's got a number of schools, not just the NCAA championships. They have a number of schools that are selling out. Minnesota has been selling out for years, a couple of duels a year. Penn State sold out their entire season in advance. Iowa, I think at times, is still hitting sellouts. I mean, we're starting to see this around – around the country a little bit. I don't think we have any freestyle events that do that. I could take you back to the world championships a year ago, but Schneider and Sajulai have met up in the finals. That was the biggest match that UWW could possibly put on, and they did everything within their power to put that match on. And they sold 8,000 tickets, which is great. But the venue sat 10,000. So it was, it was not a sellout for the biggest possible match that you can put on. Now, those guys deserve to sell out. Those guys deserve everybody's attention. I'm just proving to your point, yeah, the NCAA is over three days is going to bring in 50,000 people. If you're lucky to get a ticket, it's already sold out. You've got to have an inside track right now if you haven't planned ahead. It seems like that's pretty good business. Yeah, I don't um, – is, is it the business model? Is it the style? What, what, would, you, what would you say – is well, that. I, think, I think there's some real credit to the NCAA. I also think that there's some real value to the Nationals. It's been around a long time, but you do have a team score. People do have college pride. In all fairness, and I go to the NCAAs a lot, it's a party. I maintain the same thing for football. I, people can say they love football as much as they want. P football is painfully boring. It is seven and a half minutes of action spread over four hours. And if you took the alcohol out of the stadium, you take the people out of the stadium. But football has found a way, to their credit, to do like, you know, pre-funks and tailgates and these different things that are alcohol-based in a party. And the NCAA's got a little of that, too. You get on a plane, you go to a destination, it turns into a great time. And it's few people watch the matches. I mean, it, it, it's not quite what it seems, but all the same, who cares? If the people are there and the crowd is roaring and somebody gets crowned a champion, becomes part of history. I think I, I think you cut out that last bit. Did you just say part of history? Yeah, I was just saying it becomes a part of history. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we caught, we kind of got into it a little bit with Cejudo, but I wanted to ask you, um, let's, let's get into some MMA. Um, I want to ask you, Suhudo is, I, I feel like, first of all, does he call you? Does he ask you for stuff? I have a, I have a little bit of a relationship with Suhudo. I, okay. I, he doesn't, like, ask me for things for some of the scripts and whatnot that he does. A lot of times he'll do it and maybe ask me after the fact, hey, did you see it? Did you find that funny? But I don't think he comes to me, like, as a mentor for anything like that. I think we're just we're just buddies, and he just knows I like that level of entertainment, just wants to, you know, ask me if I saw it. Is there fighters that do come to you that say, hey, you know, Uncle Chael, what, what should I do? And you don't have to disclose any names, but is there guys that do say, hey, I'm, I'm looking to take my career to the next level. I'm not where I want to be. Are there guys that come out to you, reach out to you? Is that, is that a thing that happens? Yeah, I get, I get asked for my opinion on a lot of that. It flatters me. I always give my opinion. I always give my advice. But, you know, I, I think I respect it more than anything else. Just somebody that has seen it, has identified okay, there's a little bit more to this business. The, the sport, go deal with your coaches. But the business side and getting people to come and watch 
the sport. I mean, I think we see that as amateur, amateur wrestlers, Christian. I don't, I don't think a lot is put on that. You know, there's a real emphasis on getting good at doing the sport and then making the false assumption, even though it's been 100 years of trying this recipe and it hasn't worked, the false assumption that if I have guys who are good at it, that will bring people in. And it never has, and it never will. Not, not enough to fill up, you know, arenas. That takes some marketing. It takes a push. It takes a pre-build. It, it, it takes educating people. I love watching wrestling matches, and any time that I know one is in town, I go watch it. I haven't been to a wrestling match in almost two years. But in two years, nobody's informed me of, of when there is. I just simply don't have the schedule. I can do a level of research on my own. I'm just sharing with you. I am a big fan, and if I ever know a match is in town, I go. It's been two years since I've gone. Mm-hmm. Back back on Cejudo is because we were talking about you know wrestling and he's you know arguably the most decorated wrestler to move into MMA and be as successful as he is. Does is he a star yet, or does he still need a little bit more? I I I because I can't tell because because for me you know you're you're in the business you understand, but for me I look at you know I and this is probably really stupid, but I look at Instagram followers to determine who's a star, and usually that can correlate. You know Connor's number one star, he sells out. He's got the most Instagram followers. Number two sellout of all time is Khabib, second most. In, and now we're seeing, you know, it trickle down a little bit with the Adesanya's and with um, uh, Masvidal's. And so, does that directly correlate, or is there a little bit more that goes into it? That's a great place to start. I mean, that's a great focus uh, to start. I'll tell you this on Cejudo. I have been with him uh, a number of times, and you got to get out of the way. I mean, pe- they come to him in mobs. It's unbelievable. I didn't even know Cejudo was a star until I walked through airports with him or I'm, you know, we're at a hotel and we're walking to get a cup of coffee in the second. The doors open. I mean, people are running up to him. Uh, it, it's pretty remarkable. He came on set of ESPN about five months ago. It was for the weigh-in when uh, Nate Diaz fought Pettis. So whatever that, five, six months ago. Okay. And we couldn't start recording because there was a crowd that formed that would not quit chanting Triple C. And when he goes online, I think I think they tease him a lot. And I think they pick on him and they call him cringeworthy and things like this. I can tell you when they see him in person, they want a piece of him, whether it's a handshake, a fo- it, it Remarkable. I've been with a lot of fighters. I have not seen personally that. So, yes, I'm going to say Cejudo's a star. Do you like the cringe? I love the cringe because he calls it the cringe. I love that he admits I'm doing something ridiculous and I look a fool and I'm not even great at doing it. And then he laughs when he's done. I love how much fun he's having having fun. Yeah. I, I, I mean, he is so happy and he is so comfortable with himself in his abilities and in his inabilities. And there's just something that is very playful. No matter how mean-spirited he's attempting to be, there's still a level of playfulness to it that, yeah, I I think it's a good time. (laughs) Do you think the level of playfulness comes with his size? It could. It could a little bit. You know, use Connor by example. Connor has some very funny and some very entertaining, but Connor will go for your throat. He will pull out your jugular uh, laughing and knowing that you're not as quick-witted, knowing you're not as prepared, sometimes knowing you don't even know the language to defend yourself if you wanted to. I mean, Connor can get vicious. Cejudo cannot get vicious. Everything he does, no matter how it's intended, comes off G-rated, PG at the worst. I mean, there's just something that's fun and lighthearted. I mean, it's, it's kind of a family event when Cejudo does it, which is very different for the way most people would, uh, would uh, approach marketing to a cage fight i think he pulls it off man that's my own opinion but yeah to your question i do enjoy it yeah i I love the cringe too and i think i think it is funny because when he when he admits it you know sigudo's not getting you know asked to come into a big hollywood movie anytime soon he's just not an actor but but i there's something so powerful and endearing when somebody acknowledges what they're doing Sure. As opposed as opposed to trying to put on a front like, uh, you know, your friend Tito, uh, who does the same things, but it doesn't go over the same way it goes with Cejudo because Cejudo plays into it, I think. 
Sure. No, I think that's right. I think the fact that Sahuno uh, Sahuno earned it, owned it rather, and did it early on. And I don't know who called him the cringe. He didn't name himself the cringe. I think people just started saying he was cringe and he was cringeworthy and he was cringe. I didn't live through that term. If if you were my age and you said somebody's cringe, you, that's not even proper English. What are you saying? But that's like a thing that kids say now, particularly mm-hmm. on social media, cringe. And that's supposed to like you know draw a definition and a meaning. The fact that he grabbed it and went with it so fast meant he was in on the gag he's able to laugh at himself there was just something about that i mean not like that's the world's most remarkable skill but it's a skill that he has and it makes it work yeah so what do you got going you got uh are you flying out tomorrow or do you have to do ariel and the bad guy what what is happening i'm actually going to go out tonight i'm going to go to uh to vegas tonight and then we're going to do a little bit of media tomorrow, but then we're going to do Errol and the Bad Guy from Vegas on, on Wednesday. The media is totally a, uh, different for a Connor event. I mean, there is something special, and there are some special attractions. And even ESPN, which owns the rights to everything, even they put an extra emphasis uh, you know, to Connor. Con- Connor changes things. Connor makes it fun, a uh, very fun fight week. So what, what does a week like that look like for you? What do you... What do you do? How does how does the week conduct? Like, do you just have ESPN desk interviews all day long, every day, or how does that work? So they usually go in fifteen minute increments. I mean, at least for the small ones, and that would even be long. You might do as, as short as an eight minute segment. Then as the fight gets a little bit closer, so now we're talking weigh in day. Then you know there's a media day, and then the weigh ins, but those are ran. Uh, in the back, but then you have the ceremonial weigh-ins. That would be like an hour pre-show, uh, and then fight day. There would be another hour pre-show followed by an extended uh, post-show. That could uh, that's usually scheduled for about an hour, but it lives on digital, so it it could actually go as long as it wants. We've done them up to two and a half hours. You know, if you're recapping or you're waiting for a guest to come up the night that Masvidal had fought uh, Diaz for the BMF title. We were waiting on Masvidal, and to get Masvidal to where we were was tough. The security at MSG was extra tough because the president had come to the show. So to get a guy from point A to point B, you just couldn't do it like there was all sorts of – it took like 90 minutes just to get George one floor up a service elevator and over to set. So we kept the show going for Masvidal. I've heard I've heard a bunch of different things about that fight when when uh, Trump walked in. I wanted your your take on this because I've heard people were booing. I've heard people were were hooting and hollering and you know loved them. I what what did you hear? They, they definitely cheered. Uh, really? He walked in. He, here here's the trick to it. If if you're a Trump hater, and this isn't a political statement, I'm just answering the question as the guy who was there. When Trump walked in, there happened to be a package that was playing on the great big. Uh, screens. People were reacting to that package or possibly reacting to Trump. Nobody knows. But the crowd had a reaction that was of the sound of, you know, uh. as soon as he got to his seat, he turned and acknowledged the crowd and they sprang to their feet and he got a standing ovation. It's wow. not a political statement of any kind. That's what happened. The second that Trump acknowledged the crowd, the place went crazy and they were very positive, And that's the truth. Gotcha. Then for these events, do you get to be a fan? Will you get to watch Connor versus Cerrone, or do you? Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. Okay. No, hundred percent. Now, I am a big fan. I like that you asked that word because I, there's no shame in that. I love being a fan. That's how my career started. That's how it will end. And when the actual fights are going on, yes, absolutely. I take a seat and I'm watching it very closely, and you know, usually got a snack or a, a soda pop with me. Or so yeah, so I'm I'm a fan all, all, all the way down to the nachos and the Coca Cola, and I will enjoy the show. And the second that main event is done, boom, you know, we go back on, and you don't show favoritism, and you just say what you saw. And, uh, that type of professionalism sets in. But yeah, when the fight's going on, absolutely going to sit back and enjoy it. Are you pretty excited about this one? I like this fight, and I think that I think that it's uh, I think it's I think there's more X's and O's to this fight than some other people do. It's it's a bit of a foregone conclusion in some people's mind that Connor has handpicked Cowboy Cerrone, and therefore it's an easy night out. And half of that statement's true. Connor picks Cerrone. I think he might have picked the wrong guy. He just he just seems to not care. He wants to, and th- and this is I, I got another follow up question about this, but. You know, Connor's no nobody's fool. He's no coward. Is he too big for his own good? Can Connor ever go back to it? Let's say it doesn't go Connor's way. 
Obviously, you know, a lot of people, I don't, I think the business goes on, moves on without Connor. It's, he hasn't won since 2016. You know, business is booming. If he loses, is that is that detrimental to his career because of how big he's become? I wouldn't go as far as to say detrimental. I mean, Con- Connor is in one of these positions where the outcome does not matter. People are coming along to see the Connor show. To your point, he hasn't won a fight just since 2016. He sold out this arena for a $10 million gate in less than three minutes. I mean, the Connor show is very real and thriving, and that doesn't just fall off a cliff. Mm-hmm. That can dip. And that continued to dip until you finally do, uh, you know, dim that light out completely. But he's nowhere near that. Connor brings a lot to the table. Connor's lost many fights before. I mean, don't forget, just to use history as an example, but the night he lost to Nate Diaz, he was not uh, supposed to lose to Nate. And he lost very decisively. What that did is created a rematch that became much bigger than the first meeting between them. So, I mean, what a difference a day makes in MMA. It all would depend how the match goes. But, yes, if Connor was to go out there and come in second with, with Donald, it could create that rematch. It could push Connor back to the deck. He could say, you know, put, put me right in there again or give me Nate or something. I think that there's a lot of plays there for Connor. But many times losing, I mean, just go ask Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua's biggest fight was this rematch. Uh, with that tub of guts Ruiz, but Ruiz beat him the first time, which made it compelling to see the rematch. For business why I'm sure Anthony, on a competitive standpoint, would rather not have that loss on his record. Business-wise, it helped him. I don't predict business-wise it's great for Connor, but I will tell you, let's see what happens. There's so many different ways to lose. They're not always just straight up. Sometimes there's controversy. I mean, look what happened with Connor and Khabib. You would never say, let's do that match again. You'd never say that. That was a one-sided beating. But when you have that controversy at the end, all of a sudden the narrative and the story changes and the focus is no longer on the fight or the control that Khabib had or the tap out that Khabib had. It's, it's just not. Things change, but you don't really know until Monday morning. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I was more I was asking, like, you know, from a business standpoint, can you put Connor in a prelim fight? If Connor... Let's say Connor slides the next four fights, and he's still probably the biggest name in the sport. Can you put him in a? Is he too big to be a prelim guy? How does yes. that? Too, yes, so, he, he would. He would be too big. Not not only for his his star power and his ranking and being a former world champion. So now you have to put him with a meaningful opponent, you know, just to get signed off by commissions. The other side of that coin is his participation in the event. You you could not pay a guy like Connor to open a show. You know, that same thing that um, use Ronda Rousey as an example, mm-hmm. or even go back to Chuck Liddell as an example. Chuck was so big and there was so much expectations and so much potential and so much that he'd already proven that his placement on the car just kept putting him in there with hammers. There was a lot of guys Chuck could have beat, but there got to be a time in a career. There's a lot of guys he couldn't beat, but he was so big. He had to go in there with those top guys or Ronda is a more recent example. You couldn't afford a Ronda Rousey with her participation on the back end of these events to not make her the marquee fight. Well, she wasn't good enough to beat the main eventers. And then on top of that, they were also making a world title fight. So in many ways, her own success competitively ended up kind of making like, hey, there's no one I can fight. If you're not going to slide me down the card a little bit and put me somewhere with my skills, I I just got to go. So that, I mean, that could potentially force guys and girls into retirement a little early i guess just because i mean you you can't you can't fight somebody that's not ranked you're just because that person that placement on the card is so low that's just not where you're at we can't pay you that low and you know you have to fight a top level guy well you're not a top level guy anymore so you just have to is i mean is that where most people in those situations and i know we have never seen a star like connor but in that situation you have to move on from the sport yeah. That's right. I mean, that that is a piece of it. Now, here, here's the other side, and I don't know that that's ever fully been tested. I mean, use the Chucks or use the Rondas, and I only I, I don't use those names to, to kick at these people. I was in their shoes as well. I just use it because it's names that you'd be able to recognize. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reason I say it's never really tested, generally when you're in that spot and you climb the mountaintop and you were the main event, generally you don't want to go back then. You just don't. Yeah. Generally you don't want to go from main event to co-main event or from co-main event to jerk in the curtain or to your point in three limb. We have seen that. B.J. Penn did that and was proud to do it and happy to do it and argued and fought and, and, and tried to do it. So it is one of those things, but it's also one of those rare things. Generally, a person just any, anywhere in life, they don't want to go down. The other bad news for them is a law of physics is anything that goes up must come down. So 
if you can see that and you can see the writing on the wall and eliminate and exclude yourself from that conversation, that's generally what we see athletes do. Yeah. And I think, um, well, I'll ask you this because, you know, I'm a heavyweight. I plan on being a heavyweight, uh, for the rest of my life. And I plan on fighting at heavyweight and a weight class that, you know, I look at a lot is heavyweight. And I would be remiss to say that I don't look at the guys that are in the sport now. And I want to ask you about Francis. Cause you, you spoke on, you know, nobody would ask for the Khabib fight again. Nobody would ask to, or Khabib Connor again. Why is it that people are asking to see Francis Stipe again? Why is it that we want to see Francis versus John Jones it, I mean, has he his perception just become reality with him? Is he has he had enough fights now and enough time to where people have forgotten how bad he got his ass beat? I mean, is that something that's happened? Man, I'm on your side of this thing. I, there was nothing in that Stipe versus Francis fight, and nothing that Francis has done since to make you think that he could get the roles reversed. To make the argument that he has, in all fairness climbed his way back up the ladder and that he is the most deserving guy that's another conversation that i would be more than happy to listen to but yeah you know francis is one of these guys he's got a real fan base there's something very exciting about him there's also something very mysterious about francis he doesn't come out and do a ton of interviews he's not the most playful guy i mean mystery is a very wonderful thing in life and he's got a little bit of that gimmick going on and i mean francis is a very real thing people love to see him fight and he's fun you know, once he gets in there, Stipe is the, really the only kind of guy that can make Francis look boring. And Stipe will go out and make him look boring again and make him look unskilled. And that's just a reality of where they're both at skill-wise. But as far as you match him up just right, oh, man, you got something there. I mean, they just did that. He's going to go fight Rosenstrike, who's mm-hmm. got a kickboxing background, who's going to, at least in theory, want to stand and trade with him. And there's something very fun about Francis and Ghana. Yeah, I just I just don't feel like I don't know how smart it is to put him in with another wrestler. I mean, we put him in with Kane, but and this is why I was asking, do we know how good Francis is? Because I feel like we don't. I feel like Kane was should not have been in that fight. I don't think Kane's skills were polished. I think his knees were messed up. There's a lot of people that argue that he didn't get knocked out. His knee, you know, buckled. And that that's why I was asking, you know, and I kind of went, you know, a little out from left field with that question, but I just yeah, I was just wondering because people want to see you know, people want to see that fight again. Not so many people. I, I don't know. Do you feel like people want to see Stipe versus Francis more or Connor versus Khabib? Uh, do you feel like there's a more legitimate argument for one or the other? Well, if I was to speak for myself, it wouldn't even be close. It would be, it would be, I didn't really want to see Stipe and Francis the first time it happened. I mean, just for me, that wasn't as, that just wasn't as big of a fight, right? Yeah. Oh, obviously. And, you know, Connor and Khabib, there's just some fun there. There's going to be an entertainment aspect to it. I did think there was some, moment. I mean, look, Khabib wins that fight any time that they fight, but I do see some opportunity there where Connor was giving him some trouble. Connor was closing. I mean, Connor did win the one and only round Khabib's ever lost. There's something to be said there to go back and watch it and say, okay, can Connor make this any more competitive? Can he make it all five rounds? Could he win, you know, a round again? Can he stop one of the shots? There is some questions there, but, um, you know, I don't know that it's always about the competitiveness. I think for the broad stroke, it is. I think that's the really is the number one thing we care about and not about the entertainment. But when you are using such an incredible entertainer like Connor, like Floyd, guys that just bring something else to the table. You know, it's not necessarily about the 15 or 25 minute contest when you can get three months of a fun buildup. I mean, there's something there. This isn't what I want my message to be, but the specific guys you're asking about, they do bring other things to the table than just punches and kicks. Absolutely. And uh, I saw I saw an interview this week with Connor. And, and Connor, I mean, he, he seems to really, uh, I think um, Kavanaugh said on Joe Rogan's podcast before um, or after he fought Khabib, you know, his ideal training camp would be to be like Rocky to go out in the mountains and and exclude himself from everybody isolate himself and I feel like Connor's done that and I feel like he he's not he he doesn't seem to be doing the same things that we would call Connor it seems like maybe he's matured a little bit I saw an interview he did he's not really attacking Cowboy he's saying listen I said I would do the fight this is the fight I want to do Cowboy's a tough guy like I just do you feel like this is good or bad for Connor's career do you feel like it could possibly hurt, help? Do you think people gravitate towards it? What, what do you think about that? Because he's not 
going after Cowboy like he would most people, like he has in the past. He just simply said, you know, I said I would do the fight, and here we are. Yeah, and it does seem like, at least historically with Connor, when Connor gets serious about a fight and knows what he's getting into, then he does very well. You know, I would argue some of those fights that Connor lost, and they're very few and far between, but, you know, Diaz part one, just uh, by example. I felt like Connor found himself in a fight that was harder than he thought it was going to be. And even when he went out and did part two and he used terms like, you know, I was going to be more efficient with my energy. But that was true. He was. He was able to extend his energy. He now knows what he's getting into. He now knows how hard he can get a, hit a guy how many times, where to grab some breathers at, and how tough the fight's going to be. And I don't know that Connor is any different than you or I as combat athletes. When we find ourselves in a match that's harder than we thought it was going to be, things can unravel very quickly. So when I see Connor not doing the media. When I see him focused, isolated, staying in the gym, I take those as good sign. I think it would be fair for me to also bring up, how long did he do that for? I mean, Cowboy has been doing this day in and day out, hasn't missed, had three fights with three of the baddest guys in the world, which means three training cramps, three walks, three weigh-ins. He's done that in the last 12 months. If Connor buckled down for eight weeks, no, that's nothing. And people that make a big deal out of eight weeks out of two years – have never done the sport. Yeah, I always find that a little weird when people say I've been training hard for this for eight weeks, and it's like, what can you train <laughs> hard for? What can you train hard for in eight weeks and be the best in the world? Sure. How about hey, Christian? How about when they go a step further? They go, I haven't had a drink of alcohol in eight weeks. I haven't. I haven't gone out in eight. And they keep saying, you're like, that was eight Saturday nights. That was eight Friday night. Like, that's nothing. What, what are you talking about? But you'll hear, and they'll be serious. You'll have athletes not only trying to tell the world this, they're trying to convince themselves. And I'm looking at going, but I know your opponent. He's done this every day for eight years. What the hell's eight weeks? I've been sober for 23 years. What do you right. mean? Right, right. What, how is that supposed to be impressive in any way, shape, or form? I you, fully agree with you. It's a very yeah. weird thing. Like when the guy's telling you that he, he, he went straight and narrow for th eight weeks, I feel as though, wait a minute, that's not what you're – what you just revealed to me is prior to those eight weeks, the whole rest of your life was a little bit of a mess. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. John Jones, just like, I haven't done Coke in, in three months. You don't even get a badge for that in AA. Like, it's why is that impressive? Days. It's been nine days. I'm ready. You can go, eh. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I mean, you've been around that guy. How does, I don't, I, that's always, that's always puzzled me. And there's a big degree of jealousy. Uh, I feel I get from, I mean, I've seen you, we've worked out together. You're a workhorse. Does it bother you to see a guy like that, that is at the top of his game and does not work at all? Because I know for I, me, I, I've seen guys, I've had teammates do not work out. You're like, well, how come coach doesn't get onto them? But that could be the reason they win. Just genetically, they're on a different level. It's a very rare thing, but it is very real. I, I got to tell you a story. And yes, it does make me jealous or, or, or envious. I look at it and go, wow, that, that sure would be cool. There was a basketball player when I was growing up, knucklehead named Dennis Rodman. But Dennis was the same way. He was in the NBA championship. He was teammates with Michael Jordan. He was part of the Bulls. And he would have, he'd be out partying until 2 and 3 in the morning, and then he'd be the starter in the game and you know, go get a bunch of rebounds and do a great job. He was just kind of one of these guys that took it a little bit more uh, lighthearted. Colby, Covington, by example, this was a rumor on him, but it was a rumor that I believe to be true. His senior year of college, he somewhere got involved in like this, this group of guys that went and played poker. But the way that worked is they went into a house, there was no drink, there was no anything, and they played cards all night. But there was something about that, at least by rumor, that helped to kind of keep him grounded, helped to kind of let him check out and, and, and let his hair down just a little bit. So my father... My father got a call one day from a famous trainer, a horse trainer, that calls my dad and said, there's a horse running on Sunday. Its name is Sunbest. You must go in and claim this horse and give it to me to train. Only I know how to train this horse. And this is a weird phone call, right? My dad can't wait. We tell always think you know how to train this. So I got to go buy this horse. But my dad took the guy's advice and he did it. And he gave him the horse and the horse went on to set track records five in a row, and he was on the front page of the Oregonian. When was the last time you saw a horse on the front page of the Oregonian? This trainer's secret for this horse was only he knew this horse does not train. Walk him around the track each morning, show him up on Saturday, he'll beat any horse out there. And that's what he did. And this horse won so many races, it ended up getting claimed away from my father, never won a whole, another race because the trainer didn't know the secret, which is this horse 
did not train. It just showed up on game day. And I use that example because every now and then you're going to run into an athlete like that. The more focused you get him, the more dedicated you get him, the harder he works, the worse he gets. Every now and then an athlete needs three or four workouts a week, and even those aren't very hard, but he can show up on game day for whatever reason, to the genetics, to the way his mind works, to stay, whatever it is, it works. And I think that John is falls in that category. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, there's just such a degree mentally that you have to be in. I, I've always felt best when I know nobody's outworked me. When I, I've always felt best on the mat when I'm like, there's no doubt in my mind I did more than this guy. And I feel like some of these guys can say, like maybe the exact opposite, where their mind, they feel like, oh, I've, I'm well rested, I'm good to go, like I feel good, sure. as opposed to I've worked harder than anybody. And I just think it, it all boils back, how does somebody's brain work? How, like yep. somebody, somebody might need to work out harder than anybody, overtrain, but their brain is telling them, you've worked harder, you're the best. There's no, yep. and some guys say, Hey, I feel good. I, I must be able to. I must be able to compete well. Sure. No, and Christian, you'll have seen these guys too. Who are, you're in there training every single day, and they've been gone. Maybe they were on vacation, or maybe they were sick, or maybe they were hurt. But for whatever reason, they weren't training. They come in. You're training. You're in great shape. They come in on their very first day. That's the hardest time you ever have with them. A week later, you're getting the best of them. But for that one day, that first day back, that pep in their step, they had a clear mind. Whatever it was. And that ends up being their absolute best day, which on paper should have been their worst, should have been them kind of putting their toe back in the water. But for some reason, they come in with that clear head, and they're the big problem for the workout. We see that all the time. We've probably even been that guy a couple of times. Two or three weeks later, we're a little bit ground down. We're not having the same results. There is something very odd about those guys. John specifically is an interesting one because he doesn't know it. Like, his teammates are the ones that out him. His teammates are the most jealous ones because they work really hard. John does not. He skips workouts. He shows up late. He leaves early. He's one of these guys. Parties nonstop. Goes and makes the most money. Wins the most fight. Wins the most championship. So it's his own teammates that resent it. But John, I'm not sure John knows it. I think that John believes when he tells you how much he sacrificed and dedicated, I think he believes it. Whether it's true or not, he believes it. Might help. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I... I... <laughs> I have been that guy in the past. I've seen, and I think a big degree of it is, I feel like we get a little delusional when we've spent a little time away. That I, I think that's why you see, you know, some of these guys coming back to the sport. They're delusional. They think they can do it, and sometimes it works. You know, we saw it with Uriah Faber in his fight against, um, you know, your former Ricky teammate, Simone. my su my soon to be teammate Ricky Simone. You delude yourself and you separate yourself from the physical aspect of it, and. And eventually, your mind is telling your body what you can and can't do. And right. I, I just know for me, like you, well, like what you said, I think, you know, guys leave the sport a little bit. They start to think about perfect technique. They start to forget the bad stuff that's happened when they've tried that. And for first couple of days, they're hitting it well. They're hitting it good, and because their mind is in the right place, and they, you know, they get a little bit of adversity. They get a little bit of opposition, and it shakes it. Sure. Well, and, and people talk about confidence, too, and how much confidence helps. You know, a false confidence is also very helpful. There's no better way to build up a false confidence than not doing something at all. But telling yourself all day how great you are at it. You start to believe it. You go take a month off but you're driving around your car and listening to the radio and you're picturing yourself doing everything perfect. You start to believe that. And on your very first day, you go out and you do that largely. You largely become naive again. You largely forget how hard I can push before I get tired. So you end up pushing harder than you normally would if you would have pulled the brakes on. And there's something to a false confidence. It doesn't last long. It's usually one where you usually get that one workout yeah. and then you get back in the groove and you kind of get ground back down. But there is something to be said, like the racehorse sun vest or the Dennis Rodman's or the John Joneses. There's something to be said to resting your body, but believing that you deserve it. You want to hear a funny story? Of course. So, uh, a few years back when we still lived in Missouri, my uh, my littlest brother, he um, he's doing the best right now out of all of us. But he was always, you know, kind of the struggler with, with wrestling and stuff. Uh, maybe not as much as me, but he started a little younger. And my middle brother has always, you know, overshadowed everybody. He's, you know, multiple time state champion, just, just a specimen. And so the younger one, one year he didn't qualify for state. And there wasn't a lot of guys on the team that didn't qualify for state. They had a pretty tough club. We go to the NCAAs, he watches the NCAAs, and keep in mind, he's like 8, 9, 10 years old at this point. 
we come back from the NCAAs and he's beaten everybody in the room, like dominating guys that ended up winning state in his weight class. And it was just like, what the heck? Like we should like wish the NCAAs were before. And so I just think like sometimes watching that and seeing other guys do it too. I mean, he came in and, and destroy it was, I mean, it was the talking point of the whole week. Wow. Yeah, no, that's a very real thing. I know I know exactly what you're talking about. If some guys go make it a career. I mean, it, it's a tough one. It's risky. I want to encourage an athlete to do it. Hey, you know what we should do? We should not train you and just see if you're the uh, the John Jones type or the Dennis Rodman. I mean, it's kind of one of those weird things, but to deny – we don't – the truth is we really don't know how hard you're supposed to train. I have the same mindset as you. I need to be confident. I need to know I outwork the opponent. I need to know I out-sacrificed him. That's kind of like an old-school wrestler. It developed through Dan Gable. But I share that with you, people that I admired and coaches that I had over the years. That's what they told me. And that's what I believe. And I never tried it the other way. I've never tried going into a fight or into a wrestling match without being fully trained and prepared. And, you know, the extra runs and the extra lifts and just all of those different. I don't know. But I do wonder sometimes. I wonder if I would have been one of those guys. I wonder if a little bit less would have served us more. I don't know. And I don't even know that I really think it. But I have wondered it. Yeah. So how how long have you been uh how long have you been out of the sport now? Has it, it hasn't been a year. Did you retire a year ago? June. June. Oh, so, so it's about six months, half a year. Are you starting to get a little bit of that of oh hey, maybe I could I could do I could beat these guys? Or are I you never, You know what I never did. I missed the sport tremendously for a couple of months. And by miss it I meant uh more of the social aspect. Going to the mm-hmm. gym, just by example, but that becomes a lifestyle. And, but it also was my social life. I go see the guys, you know, and practice was over. That was the best part of the day. Practice is over and you're visiting, you know, you're sitting around locker room talking, you're just kind of catching up with the boys. Yeah. And I missed it a lot. Um, I did start to find things to do with my time, though. I did start to find things that, that, that were also social that I also enjoyed doing. So, no, I haven't, I haven't had any fantasies of going back or even watching them. Oh, I could do that. Um, but I've enjoyed other guys doing it. I'm still a huge fan. I love watching the sport. I think the sport is growing even a rapid path. I've only been out for six months. I'll, I'll see guys already that are doing techniques that I've never even been exposed to in the practice room. I do feel that it's growing uh, very rapidly. Uh, still, I enjoy that a lot. I enjoy commentating on it. But, no, I haven't had the fantasy of, of doing it again. You still go in there and work out with the guys and help out when I you can? There, I go in there very sparingly. I actually have a little bit of a New Year's resolution to myself to be in there more and we've got some guys, you know, Austin and Jake, yep. just by example, Ed Herman, that have fights coming up. Paige is going about to get back on the books here. Ricky, so um, you know, just to name drop a few for you that you'd recognize. But so I'd like to be part of that in some fashion, even if I'm in there holding the water bottle. But to be part of it, and I do have a plan to go back. But yeah, I've been traveling a little bit. I'm gonna go to the Connor fight tonight, and then uh, come home for two days. Off to L.A. Cyborgs uh, fighting. Well, Juan Archuleta's fighting on that card. So. I've been a little bit busy, which has made it hard to get into the gym, but I, I do plan to start going back. You enjoy the, the busy lifestyle with the traveling and everything? Is that fun? Yeah, I would never leave my house if I didn't have to. Quite frankly. I'm a little bit of a homebody, but I do like being at the events. I do like being able to participate. It's hard to participate in this sport unless you're in there uh, competing in it. So uh, I feel very fortunate, but I also I also do enjoy that job. Well, you got a beautiful wife and two beautiful well, kids. Yeah. Why- why would Thank you want to? Why would you want to leave the house? What's outside of the why, house that's better than that? Why would I ever want to leave Miss Brittany? Come on, that's why I married her. Absolutely, stay home. So uh, let's finish with this. Uh, I want to let you go. I probably kept you longer than you wanted to stay, but um, as you look back on your career, and I know I, I think I've heard you say that you detest legacy talk and you detest uh, certain things, but looking back now, what what do you think? Is the legacy a chill son? And how do you feel? What do you feel like you left the sport? Do you have any regrets? What would you do differently? What advice would you give for a 22-year-old about to graduate college to jump into this? Sure. Oh, my goodness. I only have regrets at anything in my life. It's, it's, it's all regret. Uh, I, I, I'm speed. I'm, everything's well, hindsight for me. Everything. I should well, have put I, it on, yeah. Should have put double zeros. We're cut, right? Snake eyes. But uh, let's see. Uh, I think I would get credited for the entertainment era. And no. I don't like the entertainment area. I actually like the competitive era myself. I'm a little bit hypocritical to it. I like, you know, anybody, anytime, anywhere, anyway. I, a wrestler's mindset. Whoever shows up, you shake hands and take them on regardless of what the, the outcome is. Um, and maybe that'll be part of it. Too. I, I also did that. 
I, so I think I can be very proud of those things, but I was also a guy who, uh, you know, had some very big opportunities and they didn't always go my way. And that's where some of the regret comes in, but I don't think I'm alone on that. I think that's just, and that's part of sport. I feel like you, you better be able to deal with that because everybody's going to have those matches that, uh, you know, you sure would like to get back, but I'll tell you this, as far as my legacy goes, at least in my own head, it's a, it's just a passionate fan. And I was very proud to serve on, on every side of the sport, whether it be a promoter or a coach or an athlete or a commentator. If there's a side of the sport uh, that I love, I participated on some level. And I didn't just do that on my own. People believed in me and gave me those opportunities. I, I will forever be grateful. Absolutely. That's awesome, man. Uh, one more thing I want to ask you, um, just kind of in regards to the BMF title, and you had said, you know, uh, not being able to get – um, you know, the world championship, but, um, do you think there should be more, you know, every other, every, most every other sport, every combat sport, at least, you know, Olympics, NCAAs, there's, you know, the bronze medals, there's, you know, the placing, and those are very coveted. You, you, you become an all American. I mean, that's some, that, that's a special thing. Not a lot of guys can do it. I feel like MMA is winner take all. There's not a lot of glory for guys that come in silver. And I think we're starting to see more of it. Do you like that? Do you think that's more incentivizing? Or do you think we should have guys that get silver medals, guys that get BMF titles or most violent man, red panty night belts? What do you think? <laughs> well, I love opportunity. If there's anywhere to create opportunity, I'm all for it. You know, I was here when it was, there was no weigh-ins at all. And all of a sudden there was a heavyweight class plus a light heavyweight class. And that was, that was ground uh, breaking news. I think it was around 99 when they came out with a, a light heavyweight title as well, but that just provided opportunity for so many other people. Then they just kept working their way backwards, 85, 70, 55, 45, 30, 25. Then you had the women's division. There's just so much more opportunity out here. I was also around when the UFC had five shows a year. Mm -hmm. Pride had five shows a year. <clears throat> Strike Force wasn't even a name. Bellator wasn't even a name. WEC wasn't even crap. I mean, you know, it was very hard to get an opportunity. So I love when opportunity goes around. I hope they continue to add divisions. There was some talk around 165. That isn't going to happen. But just by example, I'd be all for it. Super fights, I'd for it. BMF, I'd be all for it. I'd like to see a 220. That was the weight class that Kurt Angle himself uh, contested. So we know that mm. that can be done. We know that there's a lot of bodies out there. I think there's a big separation between 205 to 265. And if anything should be looked at, maybe putting that – uh, what many people have referred to as a cruiserweight in there. So I just like opportunity. I think I, I would just tell you it like that. If you want to put a belt or a prize or something up, and I, I'd love if there was a way to do, uh, you know, silvers or have a tournament play it all the way to bronze. I don't see any reason not to do that and recognize those guys. But in professional athletics, we generally don't do that in any sport. Basketball does not have a, mm -hmm. a silver or a bronze. In professional sports, that just isn't really the way that it's done. Yeah. It's winner take all. It's the highest stakes. So I get it and won't advocate for that. But if you ask me if I like opportunity and I like a guy to try his best and be rewarded if he makes it pretty far, yeah, I see. I, I like the way the NCAA and the Olympics do that. I think that it, it's very nice to recognize those folks. Awesome. Jill, you got any, uh, you got any last words? I'm going to let you go here in a minute. No, no, it's great to catch up with you, buddy. I, I, I'm very happy to see you. I look forward to, you know, you're winding your college career down, so we're going to be teammates at the gym. I look forward to you coming. You'll motivate me to come back in, and I look forward to seeing you. Thanks, pal. April. See you, brother. Appreciate you, man. Have a good one. Take care.